one persons. Okay, that's not now bad. connected. All right. Yes. So probably <clears throat> some of them <clears throat> are hearing us. Yeah, this is a little bit different from Zoom, where I usually am able to see everybody at the same time on top of the screen that I'm sharing. Um, so I might. Probably here it is possible. Yeah, you see, it is possible if I bring it up and then close it again. Um, so it'll be all right. Um, OK. OK, now this will. This so has hello, everybody. It's <clears throat> my great pleasure to present you Professor Stephen Shipman from the uh, Louisiana State University at Baton Rouge. Uh, and today he will speak about reducible and irreducible Fermi surfaces for periodic operators. So please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Larissa. Um, Right. Can everybody see this? Yes. That's, that's, yes. Okay. All right. So as uh, Vladislav said, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about my recent interest, or actually over the last few years, on the, the Fermi surface of periodic operators, which is the, it's basically the, you know, the dispersion relation for fixed energy. You look at the the wave vectors that are supported by the structure. And um, the, so that the topic is the reducibility. So re, I'm going to talk about reducible and irreducible Fermi surfaces and, and tell you why this is an important topic and exactly what that means. Um, so let's start with just a review of periodic operators uh, and Fermi surface. This review here is from the point of view of of classical abstract harmonic analysis. Um, and this will just lead to the, you know, just take five minutes to describe what I mean by the Fermi surface, just so, so we have the, the same definition in mind. And so, so this is a bit abstract, and I, and I want it to be abstract, even though the particular examples that I'm going to prove today are specific to particular types of operators. So um, just tell me if you have questions on this, this particular rendition of this stuff. So I'm talking about periodic, periodic operators. And at this point of the talk, you can have any periodic operator in your mind that you would like, such as a periodic PDE in, in um, RD, or it could be a, a graph, a periodic graph, discrete metric graph. So we have an underlying space, and X could be Euclidean space. It could be a graph, a periodic metric or, or discrete graph. And there's some measure on it, like a little big measure or some weighted measure that comes from sub coefficients. And we have a free symmetry group, ZD, of translations. So we have Z, the integer um, group of integers to the D power, is acting on the space. And it's a group of symmetries, therefore it preserves the measure, d mu. And we can, we assume a compact orbit space, which means that the fundamental domain basically means the fundamental domain is, is finite. Like it's um <clears throat> it's it's a, um, a a parallelopiped or a parallelogram. And so let's take an element of, of Z D and an element in the, the measure space. And this notation x going to gx is going to be our notation for the, the, the translation or the action of the group. Stephen, and, I, I'm sorry, but I'm seeing, for example, just uh, the first uh, page uh, with the title of the talk. Nothing, nothing else. Oh, no. So you don't see me changing the page? No. Right now? Okay. Right now, I, I'm seeing uh, right. the title of the talk. Okay. So now, okay. Let me try this. Okay. Um, yes. So I put it into. Yes. I put it into. Plain I'm sorry. Plain. I see only a double F uh, and uh, none of the slides of the presentation. You don't see this slide of the presentation now. 
none of um, even uh, uh, the title of the presentation is not present on my screen. I'm sorry. Um, all right. So what I'm seeing is that I have a red um, frame around the screen that's supposed to be shared. Um, let right, me um, stop sharing and then I'll try it again. Okay. Right. Okay. Now, can you see this? The title of the talk, yeah, the okay. first page. Can you see the next page? Yes. Okay. So I'm I'm just going to leave it like this and not press play. And maybe that maybe that was the problem. Okay. So if this is if this is okay with you, I'll. Just continue like this. So you can see next page, next page. Yes, yes. OK, good. So what I was saying is that there's an underlying space that I call X with a measure, and it can be RD or, or some graph. And then we have a free symmetry group of translations, Z to the D. And we assume a compact orbit space, which just means that the fundamental domain is, is, is finite, compact. And then this is my notation for the action of the group on the space, the underlying space. And then this, as usual, induces an action on functions where you just shift the function, uh, the, the argument of the function, and that gives me a new function, gu. And then the philosophy is that this gives rise to a unitary group of operators on L2 of x d mu because shifting doesn't change the L2 norm because the, the measure is invariant under the shift. And then associated with this group of unitary operators, we have the, the Fourier transform with respect to ZD. And in, in the business of, of periodic operators, this tends to be called either the Z transform or the Floquet transform also. And it goes like this for a function on the underlying space, the Fourier transform goes to the, the um, the, the space of characters, which is C star to the D power cross X to C, and this is what it is. So it's simply the Fourier transform where the Z variable is more convenient, where Z is equal to, um, so Z is just has, has D components, and it's just E to the IK1 up to E to the IKD. So that's what the Z is. These are often called the Floquet multipliers. And this is my notation. Z to the G power is just a multi-index notation. It's just the product of the Floquet multipliers to the G power. Now, the Fourier inversion um, is, goes in the following way. So you restrict this, this, if you restrict the U to L2 of the original space, and you take X in a fundamental domain, say W is a fundamental domain, and then you look at Z that's on the unit circle, which just means that ZI is equal to one in modulus, which means that the Ks are actually real quasi-momentum. Then you have this map that is unitary from L2 of the original space to L2 of the torus with values that are in L2 of the fundamental domain. And the way we like to think about this is that W is the fundamental domain then the, the W is actually not resolved in some way by the Fourier transform. And so we still need to take values that are in L2 of that fundamental domain. So this is unitary and it's invertible by the Fourier inversion. And now we say, suppose now I have an operator, a Schrodinger operator or elliptic operator. So this so far was just the Fourier transform with respect to the Z, act, the, the Z to the D action. Now we have an operator, periodic Schrodinger or elliptic operator, and it's, it has a domain inside of L2. And being periodic simply means that it commutes with the Z D action. So if I first do a shift, then I apply A, it's the same as first applying A and then doing the shift. And then because of this commutation, with the with the, the group of symmetries, we have a Fourier decomposition of the operator in the following way: that the operator in the Floquet transform or the Fourier transform is represented by an action of this a hat of z, and this actually is 
essentially, uh, uh, it's like a diagonalization, right? Because the Z's are not coupled. So you see that U of Z, remember this is in, U of Z dot is in L2 of W. Well, this A hat is just acting on the fundamental domain now instead of in the full space. So we've reduced the operator to acting on the fundamental domain, but now that operator depends on the Fourier variable Z. Okay, so this, this A hat of Z is the important object here in this study because we, we then take the determinant of this and we look at that as either a, an analytic variety or analytic set or an algebraic set in certain cases. So let's look now at Floquet block modes. So we have common eigenfunctions of A and ZD. Those are whenever you have a common eigenfunction of both the operator and the shifts, that's just the same thing as saying that you have a Floquet block mode because you have, you have a U that satisfies this equation for some energy E. And also the U is what we call pseudoperiodic because when you shift it by the G, you end up multiplying by this character, Z to the G. And now we have this dispersion function. Dispersion function goes from C cross C star to the D where the C is taking care of the energy and the D components of C star, those take care of the different quasi momenta. Remember that Z is E to the I K. So energy quasi momenta and this D function is simply it's, it's essentially a determinant of this A hat um, when that determinant makes sense. So this is what we call the dispersion function, and this is the dispersion relation. It's a relation between quasi-momentum and energy. So this function equal to zero is, is valid if and only if there exists a flow K mode at that energy and those at, at that some quasi-momentum. Then the flow K or the Fermi surface for A, for this operator, at energy E, and so we say add energy E means you fix the energy and then you look at all the solutions of the dispersion relation. So you're looking at all quasi momenta. So this is default quasi momenta that are actually admitted by the operator at that energy E. So it's the zero set of this relation. In other words, it's all Z's, all quasi momenta such that there exists a function u at that energy so that the operator actually has an, an, um, an eigenfunction at that energy. Now let's let's just look at let, let's specify a little bit more our this has been quite abstract so far. Now if the a here is actually a, a partial different a periodic partial differential equation it turns out that this is actually an analytic variety in z or an analytic set in Z and E. For quantum graphs, which is what I'm going to talk about today, um, it turns out that this function is a Laurent polynomial in Z. I'm talking about the D here. So it's a Laurent polynomial in Z. What I mean by a Laurent polynomial is that it's a polynomial with positive and negative powers, but it's a finite number of powers. So it has a finite number of monomial terms. And the coefficients are meromorphic in E. In the, in the energy. For discrete graphs, it turns out that it's a Laurent polynomial in Z, but it's polynomial in the energy. And I'll be um, focusing on this part right here. My goals in for broader goals in this research agenda is to try to understand the PDE case better. And it turns out to be a rather difficult problem. So I'm going to show you some very nice um, some, some, some examples and some work I've been doing recently on quantum graphs with regard to the reducibility of this set. So, um, yeah. So how is, the, how is this, this uh, D now related to the spectrum? Well, the spectrum of the operator A is all of the energies for which there is a, a, a quasi-momentum on the unit torus, meaning real Ks, right? 
real quasi momenta, so the Floquet parameters are on the torus, such that this operator is non invertible. That's just that's the same thing as saying that there exists a Floquet mode for real quasi momenta at some real energy. And that is the spectrum. Okay. So which is equal to all energies such that, so this is a nice geometric way to look at it, all energies for which the Floquet surface that I described over here, the zero set of D, actually intersects the torus. Because that's exactly when there is a Z, um, there's a Z uh, such that D is not equal to zero, and that Z lives on the torus. And it's it's important for it to be on the torus because that's where the Fourier inversion happens. And this condition that this is non-invertible simply means that on the torus, the, this operator is not invertible. Therefore, E is in the spectrum. So that's where this comes from. And so, so this this is another important point of the of the theory right here that the spectrum is the intersection of this this object here, which varies as the e varies, right? And then as you vary the e, you look at where this object intersects the torus inside a complex d-dimensional space. Now here is the main concept for this talk, which is the reducibility of this Fermi surface. And I'm just writing, recalling what the Fermi surface is. All Z, Floquet multipliers Z, so that D is equal to zero. The reducibility means that there's a non-trivial analytic or polynomial, depending on the case, factorization of D with E fixed. Fix an energy, and if the D can be factored, then it's reducible. So let's think about this for just a second. As I said, in the case of quantum graphs or any or, or even discrete graphs, this D here is actually a polynomial, a Laurent polynomial in the Z. And if this Z has more than one um, component, so in other words, if we're more in more than one dimension, then I have a polynomial in more than one variable. And as we know, it is not it is not um, generic. It is, it is non-generic for a polynomial of more than one variable to actually factor into polynomials. And so that's why this is actually a quite a special situation when you actually have this factorization. So reducibility of the Fermi surface is in some sense a rare event because the polynomial in many variables has to actually factor. Okay. And then you can also see that this can turn out to be a difficult problem if you're trying to prove irreducibility, because proving that a polynomial of several variables doesn't factor is a very non-trivial task. And typically, if you don't have any theory behind it, typically that's you know that's going to involve using Grubner bases and a lot of um, computational power in algebraic geometry. All right. So why is it why is this problem important? Why do we care about the factorability? Or the reducibility of this Fermi surface. The main reason is because of this theorem in 2006 of uh, Kutchman and Weinberg. And there's an earlier theorem around 2001 or 2000, something about around 2001, dealing with analytic varieties. But this is the one for discrete graphs. And also, there's a similar one for periodic uh, for, um, <clears throat> quantum graphs and other periodic operators. But I just wrote it down for discrete graphs. And what it says is, this is from this paper. If you have a periodic operator A and B is a local perturbation, okay, supported on a finite set. And then you take a lambda. Now this E is going to now switch to lambda when we come, become more specific because that's usually what people use in this literature. <laughs> So you let lambda energy belong to the interior of the spectral band. And suppose that the Floquet surface is irreducible. So you cannot factor this thing, which is 
typically the case, right? Then this lambda cannot be an embedded eigen, or, or it says that suppose that lambda is an embedded eigenvalue. And so this word embedded is a very important. So I have an energy inside of a spectral band and you want it to be an eigenvalue. Then the corresponding eigenfunction has to be compactly supported. And then there's a bound on the support. So this theorem says that, so essentially what it's saying is that if the Fermi surface is not reducible, then you cannot have embedded eigenvalues unless the eigenfunctions happen to have compact support. So let's think about this compact support um, um, condition or, or um, property. Well, say if you're talking about second order operators, second order elliptic operators, we can even think smooth coefficients. Well, there's a principle of unique continuation. So it's not possible to have eigenfunctions of compact support. And that's basically why second order elliptic operators cannot have embedded eigenvalues if they're if they're periodic, assuming that we know that the Fokke surface is irreducible, which is generally understood but not proved in very many cases at all. All right, so this compact support is is a strange thing that happened that can happen for graphs because you don't have you, you don't necessarily have a principle of unique continuation for graphs. For some graph operators you do, and for some you don't. So the moral of the story is that in order to get embedded eigenvalues, the Floke surface has to be irreducible. These compactly supported ones only happen at very special energies anyway. Okay. All right. So I want to talk about some theorems that are that are out there on irreducibility and then the new theorems that I'm I'm interested in in reducibility of Fermi surfaces. So that and that was the title of the talk, if you remember, that I it's reducible and irreducible Fermi surfaces. What are the properties that render it reducible or irreducible? And I'm going to concentrate on reducible ones, constructing reducible Fermi surfaces. So back in 1988, 1993, Betik and Gizek, and Trubovitz proved that for the discrete two-dimensional Laplacian plus a periodic potential for the usual Laplacian in 2D, the discrete one, on a lattice, if you add a periodic potential of any two periods, then it turns out that they can prove that the Fermi surface is actually indeed irreducible. And this, this actually is a non-trivial proof um, because you're trying to prove that certain polynomials are not factorable. And without some theory behind the algebra, it's really hard to do. But by using um, algebraic techniques, they're able to do that. Um, they actually have to use a compactification of the, the block manifold, which is the dispersion um, relation, essentially. Um, and then this was done in 3D by Batik, also in around the same time. And I believe that this was his, um, you know, this was the PhD thesis, and then he did this later. Now, here's, this is a very recent result, 2020, just a few days ago. <laughs> very uh, convenient for this talk. Just a few days ago, Wen Tsai Liu at um, Texas A&M University, he told me that he has now proved, he's been working on this quite um, diligently in the last um, year or so. He's told me that he's now proved it for the discrete the n-dimensional Laplacian plus a periodic potential. In fact, he's proved it for all energies, whereas this was for all except finite number of energies. And not only that, is it, um, he also knows that there are no embedded eigenvalues because he's able to prove a principle of unique continuation for the ND Laplacian plus a potential, which has not been known up to this point. Um, so this is new, and I still have to read it. Okay, so we know this for, for ND Laplacian. And now for the, the only continuous case that's known is continuous 3D Laplacian plus a, a periodic potential of this kind. And the same people did that. 
All right, so up to around 1993, no work has been done on this, actually trying to prove irreducible irreducibility. Um, and uh, so then I got interested in this because I started looking at bilayer graphene. And I saw some physics papers that I didn't understand because um, there are physics papers. And supposedly they had some embedded eigenvalues in bilayer graphene, at least according to the pictures and, and, and the words. So what I want to do now, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> there's, there's one more theorem on irreducibility, um, a recent theorem. And this is a, a theorem that I did with uh, Wei Li, who was a postdoc at LSU, and now is going on to DePaul University. It uh, should be published soon. Um, I think people are taking the coronavirus as an excuse not to not to look at um, their editorial duties. Um, I'm not really sure. Um, anyway, so so the theorem is on irreducibility, and it says that if A is a doubly periodic discrete graph Laplacian, so we are now extending that theorem from before on the usual Laplacian to any kind of graph Laplacian on a periodic uh, graph. So you can take any periodic graph and just define this graph Laplacian. If it had this discrete black graph Laplacian with positive weights and the associate graph is connected and it's planar with two vertices per fundamental domain. So it, planar is the idea, is that the, plan, uh, the, the my conjecture was that the planarity of a graph would prohibit the, the reducibility for certain reasons. Um, and then it turns out that that's in fact true. Now, this is a big restriction, two vertices per fundamental domain. It turns out that there are actually lots of graphs still, even with two per vertices per fundamental domain. There are 16 different equivalence classes. And we, we did this by actually going to Grubner bases and using computational, computational tools. And it was very uh, computational intensive, but um, it's it's very difficult to see any theoretical reasons besides the computation. Um, and this actually extends to any doubly periodic self-adjoint discrete graph operator with complex coefficients. It turns out that the Fermi surface is always irreducible, except reducibility will happen and, and for special weights, think only for this particular planar graph. For some reason, and there's, there's, I do, we do not have a good insight as to why this graph turns out to be special. It's a computational result. Um, anyway, let's let's go on to reducibility. So, I I have basically three different classes of reducible operators. I want to start off though with, so this is now theorems on reducibility, okay? I wanna start off with what I might call the easy case of reducibility. And I wanna make clear that, that this easy case really is easy, okay? And why the harder cases are actually hard. So let's, let's, let's see, I, we're given a self-adjoint graph operator A and some, so L the Hilbert space is L2. Okay, so it's imagine just, it could be just a graph Laplacian or, or anything you want. And now what I'm going to do is take several copies of this graph operator. So the direct sum of several copies. So this A here has some domain. And I'm going to take a large A here and I'm going to take several copies. This is, this right here just means uncoupled copies. So I just take several copies of this and then, so first of all, if you just do this, it is totally obvious that the, re, that the Fermi surface is, is reducible because it's just the, it's an M fold. Um, so it just has the same Fermi surface with multiplicity M. Okay, so it's reducible in kind of a trivial way. But then what you can do is you can couple, see, you can take a new operator and then you can you can couple it by these coupling constants kappa i j, and this l here is allowed to be an operator that goes from one 
one, one of these uh, copies to another copy. But then these coupling constants, kappa ij, if, th if this is actually a, a Hermitian matrix, then it turns out that this operator can be block diagonalized, or the lambda j's are the eigenvalues of this Hermitian matrix. So th this whole operator gets block diagonalized like this with different eigenvalues. So it's the original operator plus different lambdas times this L. And what the, this essentially has the effect of, of, of kind of shifting. It's not exact shift because this is not the identity, but it moves the spectrum of A around. And so you get M different um, dispersion relations for these different components of the operator. And so the dispersion function is actually the product of the dispersion functions of the components. So the, the lesson here is that if you can write down an operator that can be decomposed orthogonally, then it's a piece of tape because each one of the components contributes one, one um, component of the Fermi surface and you just have a direct factorization. So I think it's important to realize the easy case um, first. And, but then there's a theorem that says that there actually are local defects that give finite multiplicity embedded eigenvalues with eigenfunctions having unbounded support. So we're not talking about these crazy ones with bounded support. <laughs> okay, so these are unbounded support. And this I did back in 2014 um, with um, trying to understand the bilayer graphing better. All right, so now let's go on to, this was for, um, <clears throat> Graph operators. This I should have written discrete graph operators. Let's go on to quantum graphs. So it turns out that you can do something similar for quantum graphs, but it's much harder. If you start off with two layers of exactly the same graph, so this is on the top, another on the bottom, say if it's 2D, then I can connect them vertex by vertex like this. And on that connecting edge, I could put a Schrodinger operator. I'm going to be more specific about this in, in a bit. Um, but if you put a potential, a Schrodinger operator with potential on this edge that's actually symmetric about the middle, symmetric connecting edge, then you can you get a reducible Fermi surface. And the reason is that you can decompose the operator into the even and the odd states with respect to that middle plane. And the even states have one dispersion relation, and the odd states have a different dispersion relation, and these correspond to different sets of bands and gaps, and they then correspond to the different components of the Fermi surface. And so one of the lessons here is that the proof of reducibility relies on the reflectional symmetry. So whenever you do have an additional symmetry, with respect to like, like reflectional symmetry with these different layers, then that allows you to do a decomposition, then that's really the easy case. Um, I'm not saying it's not interesting because there's some very interesting stuff that arises from this, um, this local defect. But when you don't have this reflectional symmetry to help you, then things become more difficult. And so that's, that's where I, I want to now show you the next results. So I'm going to show you theorems of reducibility of the Fermi surface of what I'm going to call type 0, type 1, and type 2. They're genuinely different, and it happens for different reasons. Um, so you might wonder why I call this one type 0. The reason is that I did this first, and then in a later paper I had type 1 and type 2, which were new, and so I wanted to give this a type, so I called it type 0. All right. So what I'm going to show you, and I'm trying to do it in pictures, and I'm trying to be as, as um, specific as I can um, without getting, you know, trying to balance um, too much notation with uh, too little notation. <laughs> um, so this is a, a picture of bilayer graphing where the, the vertices are exactly stacked one above the other. They call this the AA stacked graphing. And this is just for the for the illustration. The top graph and lower graph in this type are exactly the same graph with exactly the same Schrodinger operator on each one of the edges. And it could be d-dimensional, it doesn't have to be two. So at the top here, on each one of the edges, I parameterize that edge with x. 
and I put an ODE on that edge. So this is a Schrodinger operator. And on the bottom, have exactly the same Schrodinger operator on exactly the same periodic structure. And one thing that I, I guess I, I forgot to actually, or maybe I thought it was, I'll just say it. This, this Schrodinger operator has to be accompanied by um, conditions at the vertices that couple <clears throat> the functions at the vertices. And these are either Roban conditions or what they call the Kirchhoff or the or the Neumann condition. So the sum of the the sum of the the outward derivatives is a multiple of the value. Anyway, there are vertex conditions that accompany this. So I have this operator, and now I'm going to couple two copies of the same operator by these edges. So I put edges everywhere, and I put a Schrodinger operator. And here's a potential Q e of x. So this e corresponds to an edge. And you see that for graphing, for example, there are two vertices per fundamental domain. These two vertices, green and red, they repeat. And so I'm allowed two different potentials, one for the green vertices and one for the red vertices. This one and this one. So these can be two different potentials. And as I said in the previous slide, if this is a symmetric potential, symmetric about the middle, like something that has maybe a a well at the, in the middle or it has a peak or something like that and it's symmetric, then I can do the even and odd decomposition and then the redu re reducibility of the Fermi surface is very easy. So what I was interested in is, well, what happens if this is not symmetric? And that was, that this is really my goal in all of this stuff. If you don't have the symmetry, how can you still possibly get embedded eigenvalues? And this has been an issue um, in electromagnetics that I, I, I was motivated by, but that the problem of electromagnetics turns out to be very difficult, and I want to come back to it after understanding the quantum graph problem better. <clears throat> so the, the problem here is if I take potentials on these edges that are not symmetric along the edge with respect to the middle of the edge, then I cannot do any kind of even and odd decomposition. Okay, so I cannot just get a reducibility of the Fermi surface using symmetry. But there's a theorem in this in this paper right here that says that for this kind of graph, the Fermi surface of a periodic bilayer quantum graph is reducible if the potentials on all the connecting edges, so the two potentials here, possess the same spectral asymmetry function. And I'm going to define this for you. So there's a certain spectral function that comes from the Q. And if two potentials have that same spectral asymmetry function, then we call them, I call them compatible. If it's asymmetry are compatible, they don't have to be the same. They can be asymmetric. But if that spectral function is the same, it's an entire function, then it turns out the Fermi surface is reducible. And I'm going to now describe to you this asymmetry function. And we're still working on this more to try to understand it better. Um, so this is now the spectral asymmetry function. Um, so well, let me say one more thing over here. So if I take, uh, well, okay, let me first define it. Let me define the spectral asymmetry function. So here's an edge. Think about this edge as being the connecting edge over here between these two vertices. So there's my connecting edge. And then I have this this um, eigenvalue problem on this edge. And there's a, there's a transfer matrix that takes data on one side to data on the other side. That's this, where the C um, and the S, and the C prime and S prime are coming from these special solutions. Um, so the U of X is S of X lambda, is equal to 0, 1, has data 0, 1 on this side, and data S lambda, S prime lambda on this side. And then the other, the other fundamental solution takes 1, 0 over to C, C prime. So that's the definition of these. So this is actually the value of the S of X lambda at, let's say this is X equals 1, if this, is, if this interval has length 1. 
And then, so what you can do, so here's the idea of asymmetry. You see, I'm calling a spectral asymmetry function. So if I take C hat of X lambda to start at one zero at the other side, and then I transfer over from the right to the left, then I get two new spectral functions. And so I want to compare this to this. And obviously, if the Q is symmetric, then these numbers will be the same as these numbers because the direction doesn't matter for a second order differential equation. I mean, with no first order part. And then it turns out that um, the, the S prime is actually equal to C hat. And the Dirichlet to Neumann map is equal to this. So in other words, if I take value and derivative on the two different sites, I'm sorry, let me see. If I take uh, just the values on the two different sites, I apply this matrix and then I get the derivatives on the two different sites. This is the inward derivatives. Um, the spectral A function or asymmetry function is defined to be the difference between um, the C at W, which is over, if I start at V and I go over to, I'm sorry, I didn't label this. Uh, that was bad on my part. So this is V, this is W. So the C from V to W minus the C hat. So it's, it's, it's essentially this C minus this C, which turns out to be zero whenever the Q is symmetric. And that is an, is an entire function. And it has, um, so let me tell you a few things about it. Um, so, so the point now is, is that I'm looking at a, a fixed A. So if I fix this A function, what we're interested in is what are all the potentials that have that same spectral asymmetry function? Because those are the potential that I'm allowed to use in order to get reducibility. So in some work now with Malcolm Brown, Carl, Carl Michael Schmidt, and Ian Wood, we're trying to understand this A function better. Um, so the question is, what are all the Qs? So this is a kind of inverse problem, right? What are all the potentials Q with a given asymmetry function? It turns out what, what we can show now is that, that all the A functions exactly make up this space called E1 half, which is all functions that are entire, order less than or equal to a half, and type less than or equal to one, whose integral times lambda to the one half is finite from zero to infinity. This is a class of analytic functions and it exactly coincides with all the A possible A functions that have gotten from Qs inside of L2. So the, there's a correspondence between these and Qs in L2. Now, using inverse spectral theory of Persia and Trubowitz, there's this spectral data that, um, so what they do is they take a Dirichlet spectral sequence to do the inverse problem. Take a Dirichlet spectral sequence and this data which turns out to be a certain function of the A function evaluated at the spectrum, at the spectral sequence. Take spectral sequence, evaluate the A, and you get certain data. And you can use this data to exactly reconstruct the Q. That's what Parshall and Trubowitz did by using these things, these kappas, and they're related to the A's in this way. And then, so this inverse problem involves spectral sequence and the data, K, K which now turns, so, so that what we had to understand now is that this data of Persia and Trubowitz, the spectral data, which are, which are some kind of norming constants, is they're exactly equivalent to knowing the A function. Oops. Exactly equivalent to knowing the A function. And this is actually a very non-trivial step. And we were able to understand this by looking at some of the very, very nice work of, of Trubowitz, also McCain. But you know that Trubowitz has this very nice sequence of papers on spectral theory with different people that he was obviously driving. And this first one uh, with McCain actually does some very nice interpolation theorems. And through these interpolation theorems, we find that um, the K the kappa n's, which live in L2, 1, are exactly evaluating A at the, at the spectrum, and then you can recover the A from the evaluations on the spectrum. So there's one-to-one -one correspondence through an interpolation theorem. 
Okay, so now we have a nice handle on these A functions. So it turns out that this, this question here, what are all the Qs with a given asymmetry function? Well, it's an inverse spectral problem, so it's very difficult to actually understand qualitatively what the Qs look like. But what we do know is that for a given A function in this class, there's exactly one Q for every Dirichlet sequence. And when the, when the A is equal to zero, that's just corresponding to symmetric Qs. And it has already been known that symmetric Qs are in one-to-one -one correspondence with Dirichlet spectral sequences. All right, so this is, this is um, all I'm gonna say now on type zero. It, it has to do with, so that the reducibility is based on, so you have top and bottom, let's just review top and bottom graphs are exactly the same, but the reducibility comes from the Qs being in the same equivalence class, asymmetry class, spectrally. So let's go on to type, what I call type one. So um, in type one, um, yeah. Okay, so this, this, is what, this is what happens. So this is a one-dimensional depiction of the kind of graph, a new kind of um, multi-layer graph that turns out to be reducible, a reducible Fermi surface. So these are the conditions. So this is a 1D depiction. Each layer is a separable periodic graph. Separable means, let's say for a two-dimensional example, it means that that periodic graph has a, a special vertex V. So that if, we, if, you review, if, we, if you remove that vertex V and all of its translates, then the graph separates into finite pieces. That would be separable. And the dispersion function is a certain polynomial in a fixed Laurent polynomial zeta. So it's a function of a certain zeta. In particular, you could just say, well, the graphs can be different at the different layers, but they have to be a function of the same dispersion function at the top, like this one. I'm, I'm going to show you examples of this um, in, in multi-layer graphing. And so, and, and then they're coupled periodically by a repeated connector graph. So we have this very general kind of connector graph. It can be anything in the world, finite that's connecting the same vertex at the separable, the same separable vertex at all the different levels. And we repeat this periodically. An example is a W period. Okay, that's this. Now the theorem says that this kind of multilayer quantum graph of type one has reducible Fermi surface. Um, I would say that this is highly non-obvious. Um, and I'm gonna show you something about the proof, but not the full proof, obviously. This dispersion function so the and, and so here's here's the point that this ends up being reduced a bit because its dispersion function turns out to be a polynomial in this original one. So if all of the per, all of the dispersion functions for the individual layers are polynomials in this fixed function, then the multilayer graph turns out to be a polynomial in this zeta. Therefore, you can just factor this as a function of one variable. You see? So this is a polynomial in this variable, and then you can factor it. And then the, the, different, um, the different components are simply, well, the roots of P equal to this zeta. And so you really have this zeta equal to different functions of lambda, and those are the different, um, the, the, the different components. This has been recently submitted. Um, yeah, so, so I wanted to say just a little bit about this type one. There's a little calculus of, um, for joining two periodic graphs. You see how you can kind of do this inductively. You start with one layer and then you attach this decoration. And then you attach another layer at this vertex and then you attach another layer at every Every time you attach, you're attaching at one point periodically. And it turns out that there's a calculus for joining two periodic graphs. Let's say just the shorthand notation, if you have a certain graph, let's call this the dispersion function. And then if I put this V here, that means you replace that V just with 
Dirichlet condition, just like over, over here. You replace this V with just Dirichlet conditions at the new, at the new vertices. Um, and now what you can do is you can take one graph and another graph, and you can join them at the V1 in one graph and the V2 in the other graph. That's like taking a V1 here for this graph, V2 for this graph, and you join them. And so you actually, I'm being, you actually have to join them through this, this extra graph here. So you really join the black one to the blue one here, then you join the blue one to this black one here, and you do this recursively using the following lemma. So you start with two graphs, and the V1 and V2 are special vertices. Then if I take the join of those two, you have this kind of calculus for the dispersion function. Dispersion function of the join can be obtained by the dispersion functions of the individual graphs and the dispersion functions with the vertex replaced with Dirichlet conditions. And so the proof involves using this over and over in an inductive way to obtain the theorem. And that's what it says here. Inductively use this lemma each time a layer is attached to the connecting graph. Okay. Um, all right, so now it's type two. This is the last type. This is actually quite different, um, even though there's some overlap with type one. So look at this here. Um, th these, these vertices of connection are not necessarily separable anymore, like they were over here for type one. And it turns out that these, so these are the conditions. Each layer has the same underlying bipartite periodic graph with two vertices per period. In particular, graphing satisfies this. And in fact, this type two here is a result of something I noticed in the previous paper on, the, um, on type zero with the A function. Because it turned out that for graphing, even if you had connecting edges that were not in the same asymmetry class, it still turned out to be reducible. And I wanted to understand why that happened for graphing. And it turns out that the properties that you need is this underlying graph is bipartite, two vertices per period. In fact, you cannot go to tripartite with three vertices per period because it fails. So it is actually that specific. And here's a very, here's a very, very nice, um, the next condition. The graphs can look the same, but the potentials on the graphs are allowed to be different. Say on this edge here, on this edge here, you're allowed to have different potentials. But those potentials have to have the same Dirichlet spectrum. And then you can use two different connector graphs for the two different color vertices. And the theorem says that this type has a multi-layer graph has reducible Fermi surface. And again, you can find the, 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 the dispersion function is a polynomial. Eh? It's a polynomial in this dispersion function. And you can actually explicitly write down what this W is. You see, so this, it, so I, did, I'm, I'm, I didn't write stuff out. I'll just tell you. So th this turns out to be the S function from the from the spectral matrix for the connecting edges between one vertex and all the other, say the red vertex and all the other vertices. And this corresponds to the, you know, going from the, the L power tells you what the connections are between the different fundamental domains. So what's interesting is that this W depends only on the S's, but not on the C's. And this S is actually equivalent to knowing Dirichlet spectrum. So that's all you need to know about these connecting edges. All right, and so I'm not, obviously, I, I just cut this from the paper and I wrote proof here. And the only thing I wanted to say about this is that the proof is linear algebraic in nature. And these, these properties, um, you have to kind of be intelligent about it, but it's, it's linear algebraic. <clears throat> That's this paper right there. Okay, so I'm going to end in a couple, um, about five minutes. So what I'd like to do is show you um, one of my, as I said, one of my motivations or kind of sub motivations 
for these particular uh, types of graphs is was multilayer graphene. And multilayer graphene fits this type two and type one. And so it turns out that you can kind of take combinations of type one connections and type two connections to get very general types of multilayer graphene. So let me show you something about that. So reducibility of the Fermi surface from multilayer graphene. <clears throat> Let's start off just by understanding the different shifts and rotations that are available for multilayer graphene. So this is just a piece of the hexagonal structure. It repeats periodically. And let's say that the original structure is the black one. And the C1 is one direction of periodicity, one vector of periodicity. C2 is a different vector of periodicity. So if I add C1 and C2, I get this vector from here to here. And it turns out if I take, so this is another vector of periodicity, but if I shift over by one third of this sum, then I end up with the orange graph. And then if I shift again, I end up with the blue graph. And if I shift again, I'm back to the black graph. And these two shifts are known, of course, in the literature. And the, the blue one, let's, let's call it the B shift. And the, and the, no, yeah, the orange one will be called the C shift. And then the A shift is actually no shift at all. So you have A position, B position, and C position. Now, another thing is that suppose I have, um, say, a potential zero here, potential one, and potential two. There are three edges per fundamental domain. So I have three different potentials at my disposal for this periodic graph, two edges, I mean, sorry, two vertices and three edges. So say I have potential zero, potential one, potential two, and I parameterize them in this direction as functions of X. If I rotate this graphing about the middle right here, it turns out that, well, this goes over here, this goes over there, this turns around. I get exactly the same graph, except that the potentials are actually oriented in the opposite directions. Now, if the potentials are oriented in the opposite directions, the Dirichlet spectrum is exactly the same. And so I'm allowed to use this and this as two different layers in type two um, multi-layer graphing. So I can do what's called the AA stacking. And this comes from type two, and where the, the green and red connectors are very simple, just edges. And as I said, I'm allowed to rotate the different um, layers. Um, I'm also allowed to do AB stacking. This AB stacking is, is this. So I have the A shift and the B shift, and I connect red to green. This is actually type one, because graphene is separable at the red vertex. It's also separable at the green vertex. And this is a fundamental domain. So this also works. And I can do ABC stacking. And this is less obvious because you have to kind of use the type one and type two connections in some, um, in a way that you have to use your head a little bit. It's not completely straightforward. This is a fundamental domain. This is actually has reducible Fermi surface with four different components. And to some extent, you can actually compute these pretty well. Now here's what I'm calling mixed stacking. So here's the original one, I can shift it then shift again and maybe shift back. So this actually is reducible and it has six components. Um, and so let me show you some pictures of the Fermi surface. So this will be for um, AA stacked graphene, going back to, to this kind right here. AA stacked graphene is um, maybe interesting in the sense that you can set things up so that Dirac cones are actually preserved. So there's this issue of Dirac cones, which I don't have any time to talk about, but that's obviously, as, as we know, one of the, that, that's the driving force for the, the, you know, the study in physics of graphene, because there is this Dirac cone, and at a Dirac cone, you have a linear dispersion relation, which is this cone right here. Um, and so what I want to show here is that, um, yeah, so this is actually the two, two different pieces of the dispersion function, lambda going from minus six to zero, 
and from 10 to 30 for bilayer AA stack graphene. And the, the blue and the yellow are actually two different sets of bands and gaps that come from the two different components in the reduction. Um, and when you um, Yeah, so this is if you couple them um, in a way that the two different coupling, uh, so, so the coupling, the red and the coupling are exactly the same, then you actually preserve the Dirac cones, which is interesting. Because usually when you couple two stacks of graphene, the, the, the cones go away. So I think this is a new, a new kind of result here. Um, so this is the typical thing. If you couple them in a more arbitrary way, then these Dirac cones actually disappear. And they become uh, the usual types of band uh, uh, gap edges. So you get gaps inside. So the certain robustness of um, the certain types of coupling. Um, yeah, so there, there's a lot more that I'd like to um, understand here. A lot of questions that have arisen um, from this. And, and so what, what I, what I want to do is just stop here and just remind you that the, the, the agenda was to try to understand reducible, ah, reducible Fermi surfaces. And one of the main reasons is because of the existence of the, the, the possibility of existence of, of um, interesting embedded eigenvalues. And then when you perturb systems with embedded eigenvalues, you get interesting resonance phenomena, which, which uh, I'm, I'm interested in. All right, so thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, great talk, very interesting. Thank you. If there are questions, please switch on microphones. Either too easy or unintelligible. Which one was it? <laughs> it was. It was very interesting. And uh, uh, for example, I I, I have uh, uh, some small questions. Like for yeah. example, uh, uh, what could we see uh, an example uh, of uh, two potentials sharing the same A function? <laughs> okay, so Ladislav, yeah, this is one of my first questions that I asked myself. And that is so hard to do. And, the, you know, the reason is that the doing the inverse problem is, is explicitly is so difficult. So that is what you might say the embarrassing thing about this. I cannot take an A function to the lab and tell the people, give me two different potential. What are they going to have to do? They're going to have to take two different Dirichlet sequences, do the inverse problem, and see what it looks like. So that's one of these questions that I don't know the answer to yet. And what it was one of the original questions I'm going toward. So I'm sorry that that's, it, that's the state of my knowledge at this point. Yeah. And what? it has not, nothing to do with, it, for example, with the Darbu transform, nothing to do. Maybe, maybe, yes. Maybe. But I don't know yet. So well, actually, Vladislav, what I can say is that there are some, there are some qualitative uh, things I can say about what those cues will look like. So, you know, this A is called the asymmetry function, and it does in some sense tell you how much asymmetry is there. So there are some equations you can write down that relate the A function, the size of the A function, to the odd part of the potential, the, the asymmetric part of the potential. Yeah, but it doesn't go much beyond that yet. Um, I see a lot of things that I think are conjectures and that I think are probably true and may, might be true for a physicist. I don't know yet, but yeah, that's a very interesting and hard question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. If there are other questions, please. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, your, your microphone is off. Yeah, yeah, I, I see. Hi, Stephen. Well, thank you very much for a very nice talk. Well, I, I may have maybe just one stupid question. Uh -huh. what, what about if you consider 
um, involutive operators, I mean the operators such that some power is identical operator, uh, would it be some kind of subclass or some nice pictures for this class? And you're talking about periodic operators, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so the graphing is is not exactly that, right? But it's similar because of the bipartiteness. So mm -hmm. I don't have a good answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine that. So so what, and one of the one of the things about that is that I don't know how to come up with good quantum graph operators that have that property. So the bipart the bipartiteness of the graphing actually, see what is it? It's the, the operator squared. Um, so the, um, the dispersion function operator squared minus the energy squared for the for the discrete case is equal to zero. So yeah. instead of having, yeah, so instead of having, you know, a power is equal to identity, you have power is equal to a multiple of the identity depending on the energy. I see. Um, that, and, and so you are right that that is an al one of the algebraic factors that's contributing to the reducibility for graphene and actually type two. But I don't see that it's exactly um, involutive or um, generalization of that. I see. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I have small question. Yes. Uh, uh, there is uh, some difference uh, between the conductivity the one-layer graphene and two-layer graphene and multi-layer graphene. There is uh, some results about the conductivity. Um, so in, you mean in, in the physics literature? Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm not really sure about that. There's a lot of the physics literature that I don't, that, that I need to understand better. And if I understand that properly, um, it is a, so you might correct me on this, but if I understand that properly, it's a different regime of operator, right? Because you'd have a loss, right? And I do not understand any of the theory yet for lossy. I think that's what you're referring to, right? Because when you have connectivity, then you have losses. And, and I'm, I'm, right now I'm considering a completely self-adjoint situation. <coughs> So I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer for that. There's also lots of questions about, you know, in um, about the physics of uh, magnetic fields going through the graphene, which I also don't know the answers to yet. Um, okay. So, so I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer. I don't, I don't know that well enough. Yeah. And there are many results, maybe there are many re results about conductivity now, the multi-layer graphenes. There is, right. And so the, con I mean, the conductivity, <clears throat> um, at, at low energies, right, where you're very near the direct cone. Um, so what I, okay, maybe, maybe I didn't understand the question properly, but one, one thing I can say, what I do understand is that, so the conductivity, so maybe, yeah, maybe this is a better answer. Um, so still conductivity in the sense, oh yeah, yeah, okay. So in the sense of, um, okay, so not in the on the individual edges, but the conductivity of the whole sheet as a multi-layer, as a, yes, yes. So you have the conductivity with no dispersion near the Dirac cone, right? And so the electrons behave as if they were in some kind of dispersion free space right now what people have noticed right from the beginning is that when you have two layers or even more layers then that conductivity actually goes away and so you get um, um, objects with mass and there's actually their dispersion there's a, you, you get a gap where the where the direct cone was where you had the linear dispersion you get a gap and that gap is actually so it's actually due to the interaction between two layers, right? The interaction between two layers tends to split eigenvalues and it's very similar to opening a gap. So that part is actually, was known, yes. And, and what I'm seeing in what I'm doing here, one of the connections that I think is interesting is that for AA stack graphene, and I have not seen this in the literature yet, but for AA stack graphene, if you do connect two different vertices with exactly the same 
potentials, you will preserve that um, property of, of linear transport, I mean, of, of um, linear dispersion relation, um, which is typically broken. And, and related questions. Uh, the Fermi surfaces has uh, 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 everywhere has the point uh, point conical contacts, and there are the, some cases of, of the interactions uh, Fermi surfaces. Yeah, let me see. Between the two Fermi surfaces, you mean the, between the two components? Uh, so in the uh, in the one layer graphens, uh, so the uh, Fermi surfaces has the conical contacts. Yeah. Has the conical contacts. Yes, for singular and multilayer graphens, uh, there is uh, some other type of the co contacts uh, the Fermi surfaces. Oh right, exactly. So um, yes, that's so. Where the two different surfaces actually? Yeah, you are right. So you have. So what's interesting, let me show, show that, just make sure I understand what you're talking about. Right. So that that would be, yeah. so that would be let's see. Okay, like um, right here. So it's where the yellow one and the blue one come together. Right. So that those contacts are actually. I mean, they're not exactly conical, but they are like this, right? And I, I, so this is a contact between one class, or so one um, um, component and the other component. And what's what's interesting about the fact that you genuinely have two components, right? You genuinely have the reduction, is that these two components don't talk to each other in the sense of um, you can spec spec in the spectral sense. The spectrally, they're actually um, say right here. These two don't talk to each other. They go right through each other. There's no interaction. And the only way that you're going to make this one interact with this one is if you do something that violates the um, hypotheses and the theorems that tell you that you have reducibility. Um, so you do some kind of perturbation and then these two will talk to each other and now this will break. Right? Yes. So you have to somehow, so what could you do? Um, so you could perturb one of the layers so that the Dirichlet spectrum is different from one layer to the next. Then that would that would eliminate the reducibility. And typically when when you don't have two different components, it's just one component, you know, one global component then those intersection points typically will, you know, they'll split. Yeah, they will, they will, you know, split into, into two smooth pieces those, um, because there would be, um, there would be singularities. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. More questions, please. Mm. So, Vladislav, you you might actually have some insight into this in inverse problem. I don't know because that, yes, that's your <laughs> that's your thing. Um, with um, these guys in um, UK, we're making some nice progress. But um, as I as I showed you, we're writing that up now. But there's there's still a lot more to understand. Though. With your I'll tell you special functions, <laughs> you, can, you can have a lot of power with those. <laughs> Yeah. So if there are more questions. I see Professor Bandalif wants to raise a question. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, my question is uh, related about application of the Fermi surface in the theory of differential equation. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, this is so in, you go all the way back to periodic PDEs, right? All the way back to the, the work of Kutchman, right from the beginning, you have the, the, there's a Fermi surface and the analyticity of the Fermi surface is fundamental to the spectrum, right? Because, I mean, I mean, the Fermi surface, 
is this analytic variety that's coming directly out of the harmonic analysis, right? So the way I'm thinking about it from the point of view of harmonic analysis, you have the characters, the eigenvalues of the, of the group action of the symmetries. And then you have an operator that commutes with the symmetries. And then you have the eigenvalue of that. And there's a relation between eigenvalues of the, of the, of the characters, the eigenvalues of the, of the symmetries, and the eigenvalue of the operator you're interested in. And that right there is the foundation of the spectral theory for the operator. And so it's that dispersion function which is fundamental right from the beginning. So yes, it is. So for periodic PDEs, that's it, it's the object that you study. I mean, I mean, I mean, it's the object that you study from the point of view of spectrum. If you, um, then if you want to, of course, if you want to understand more things about the Berry curvature, the Berry phase of the actual eigenfunctions, then you have to go beyond the dispersion relation. You have to go to the actual eigenfunctions, and that becomes more complicated. But yeah, that's the. Um, so right from the beginning. <clears throat> people like Peter Kutchman, and, and he really drove a lot of this. That's why I keep saying his name. Um, started some very nice analysis, difficult analysis of these of these varieties. So Peter, um, you know, is trained in many things, and he knows this stuff very well, which is fortunate. Um, and at this point, I wish I knew algebraic geometry better. I mean, did it in grad school, <laughs> but there's a lot there. And so they, he continues to under to to study the. Um, Singularities of this variety because they tell you how wave packets will propagate near those near those frequencies. So yeah, it's fundamental. Thank you. Thank you. More questions, comments, marks. Deep thanks to our speaker and to our organizers. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> thank yes, you. thank you for allowing me to participate. <clears throat> thanks for thinking of me, Vladislav. I appreciate it. <laughs> Steven. Thank you very much. Steven. Yes. What kind what kind of music you are playing? Oh, so I'm I'm a violinist. Um and there right now. Let me check. <laughs> Oh, this is this is some exercises. Oh, <laughs> good. Yeah. yeah. Right. Maybe sometime we will organize some met and harmonic melody analysis seminar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for very nice talk. You're welcome. I hope I really hope it was understandable. Sometimes it's yeah, yeah. Yeah. how to organize things. Thank you. Then, thank you, you very too, much again. Right. Let well, Let's thank you. Speak up again. So, is there another one in two weeks? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. We will receive. Our okay.